Welcome to Vermontitude, a collaborative effort between Great Eastern Radio, the Brattleboro Reformer, and BCTV to bring you the stories behind the stories on the topics you want to learn more about. Because there's always more, so there'll always be Vermontitude. Hosted by me, Peter Fish Case. Welcome to Vermontitude. New episodes drop every Tuesday and can be found by going to vermontitude.com, reformer.com, brattleboro.tv, and locally on Comcast Channel 1078. We come to you from the studios at the Innovation Box on Flat Street. I'm Peter Fish Case, and each week I cover the topics that are of concern to Wyndham County and the towns that reside within its borders. Joining Vermontitude today, Wyndham County Representative Emily Kornheiser. Welcome. Thank you for having me here. It's great to be here. Thank you for uh, thank you for agreeing to do this. All right, I guess we talked a little bit, and I guess for context, we should talk a little bit about what you what you do within the house. So g- give us the give us the snapshot. Thanks. So I am a state representative for Wyndham Seven, which mm-hmm. is basically West Brattleboro. There are three representatives from Brattleboro. We cover three different sections of Brattleboro. We're in session from January to May because we're a part-time legislature, so we all have other jobs. We have to do something else to pay our bills. Right. And so from January to May, we're in session Tuesday to Friday, sitting in committee rooms, voting on bills on the floor. I serve as the chair of the House Ways and Means Committee, Okay. and that's the committee that's responsible for tax policy and revenue in the Vermont House of Representatives. So it's your fault. <laughs> This is only my second year all that right. I'm about to enter as chair. So I am um, trying to retain all of the great parts of our tax policy and make some, hoping to make some good changes. Yeah, I mean, tax, taxes are a necessary thing. We're, we're not, we're not going to get away from them. It, it, it's how we, it's how we rebuild our, our infrastructure, the roads, all that. So I know the taxes are, are, are a drudge, but they're a necessary drudge. I think they're actually a really beautiful part of how we each contribute to the shared project that is civilization. Oh, look at you. I know. Nice spin. I like that Thank one. Thank you. That's a good one. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, so one of the one of the issues that, that uh, I've been kind of focused on as of late is a lot of these uh, released on conditions, seeing what it does to our local police department, um, the current bail proposals that are out there, um, some of the current ba- bail that is already set. Can you speak to any of that? I mean, like, what is your role or what is the House's role in changing this legislation or, or, or just creating new stuff? So all of criminal justice reform and how it impacts our community is really complex. And I think sometimes when we're experiencing challenges here in Brattleboro, mm-hmm. it's easy to say that this is the problem and this is the solution instead of sort of unpacking all of the pieces. Okay. But in terms of sort of how our criminal justice system works, there's the judiciary, which, yep. as you might remember from Schoolhouse Rock, is an independent branch of government. <laughs> yes. And so our only real power with regards to the judiciary is um, working on their budget, which okay. they propose to us, and then approving it or not, um, or shifting it. And then, of course, sort of setting the laws, that the guidelines that right. they operate right. in. Some of the challenges that we're seeing with the judiciary is actually about a shortage of judges, mm-hmm. a pretty profound shortage of, okay. of judges. All right, this is a new one to me. And that is part of part of that is just you know we're seeing a big generational shift in Vermont. A lot of people retiring. Yep. All over the country, but mm-hmm. Vermont has, as we know, a huge concentration of baby boomers right. who moved here in the '60s. Hippies finding a better way. A lot of them became judges. Yeah, okay. Might be the man now, but that's yeah. okay. All right. Um, and we're seeing sort of a sea change of retirements there. And um, the governor's administration is sort of slow to appoint. The governor's slow to appoint new judges. And it's just sort of a slow process as people get on board, as new people apply. And so that's causing a pretty big backlog. Okay. I think the best person for you to talk to about all of this is Nader Hashim, our state senator. Yep, I've who, heard of him. Um, he is, <laughs> he's right. the vice chair of the Judiciary Committee, so he thinks about these issues all day, every day. Okay. They are, um, in terms of my sort of power in it as an individual representative, I talk to folks in the Wyndham County delegation, including Nader. I talk to my colleagues. But I don't get to like get into the knit and grit of the legislation related to judiciary issues because I don't serve on that committee. Okay. All right. Fair, fair enough. Um, I was not aware of, uh, of judges not being appointed. That was – see, this is, this is why we ask the questions, Absolutely, right? We learn yeah. when we ask yeah. questions. Yeah. So There's uh, a really interesting piece of criminal justice <laughs> work, um, which I did not know until I sort of got into the legislature and started digging into this a little bit. 
But there's all of this research that sort of the impact of really any kind of um, crime and punishment or using jail as a mm-hmm. prevention for yeah. crime. Yeah. M- the majority of the impact of it only comes if there's a quick turnaround. If it's basically like arrest and trial and prison quickly. Right, which and doesn't then, happen. Which does not happen mostly because of the backlogs in our court system, not because of anything in the law. Okay. And then after that, the amount of time someone stays incarcerated actually has very little impact on whether or not they're going to be a repeat offender. Right. It, it, only, it only helps uh, you and I who are, you know, walking around the streets and not having to, to, to witness this or run into this or have a, an occasion to However, meet this. However, when that person comes out, if they've been incarcerated longer, yeah. mm-hmm. the long-term impacts on them and their ability to integrate back into society become worse and worse. Yeah. And so long-term, the impacts on our community, both for that individual and for all of us as a community. Or worse. Yeah, it's a big conversation. It is a big conversation. It is a very big Probably con- not 15 minutes and probably not with me who um, really just touches these All issues. Right. Well, we'll, we'll have to have Nader back on then okay. and we'll, we'll, we'll put his feet to the fire. Let's, let's talk about um, some of the other community safety issues that are coming before you in the House this, mm-hmm. this session. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the challenges I think we're experiencing in Wyndham County, in Vermont, Chittenden County, Barry, St. John, all of these sort of towns that are around the size of Brattleboro, St. Johnsbury, St. Albans, Barry, Rutland, and then actually across the whole country is opioids. Yeah. And the long term, short term, all the impacts of folks living in desperate times um, and with really new drugs. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the high is much shorter right yep. now with the kind of drugs that are on the streets. Um, and so people need to engage in drug seeking behaviors much sooner. And so have been looking for, we had this really great system. I don't remember if you remember, I don't know if you remember when Shumlin kicked off the hub and spoke, yeah. we were in Rolling Stone. Mm-hmm. We were like the first state yep. to be I like, yes, remember. we have a problem. It was really considered pretty incredible that we admitted this weakness and then tried to yeah. challenge it. And well, that's, that's how you fix it. Yeah, it is. It is. And that system is not working anymore. No. And I don't think the government, the administration particularly, has been willing to admit that the hub and spoke system is not working. So our system of treatment is really designed for a different time, a different set of drugs, a different healthcare environment. Right. Um, The drugs that we're dealing with are much more deadly. Right. Uh, A much shorter turnaround. I and think the, we're, we're talking about like fentanyl and, yes. and things like that yeah. now, as opposed to when we started this conversation, it was oxycodone or um, what's the oxy? What's the other oxy? I can't remember. But uh, yeah. anyway, uh, so but uh, now we're talking about fentanyl. Mm-hmm. And not even like nice, clean heroin, but right. fentanyl. Yes. Yeah. Um, and the economy is much worse yeah. and the housing market is much worse. Mm-hmm. And so it's much easier for someone to really like tumble off the cliff and much harder for them to come back. And so we're looking at various harm reduction things that will help keep people safe and not dying. Mm -hmm. We're looking at um, how we can build out our shelter system, build out our drop-in system, build out sort of emergency and drop-in care so that folks can get off the street. Yep. Um, And making sure that folks' basic needs are met so they don't necessarily, you know, need to be asking for money. Okay. All right. Yep. No, I appreciate that. And and, and one of the things that... uh, I, I have said that there's a there's a difference between um, um, a, a victim that might approach you and a predator that might approach you when you're on the street. If we're talking about local issues here in town, mm-hmm. and that they all sort of get conflated as one person, and they are not. It, the amount of pieces of this puzzle that are all becoming one conversation is mm-hmm. really incredible. Yeah, and it gets a little messy. Gets really messy. It does. Um, let's jump to uh, one of the things that I, I guess. Uh, through through conversation, um, it's it's H ten, and if if I read this correctly, it's an employment growth incentive program. But unfortunately, it seems to have gotten a little dissipated. Um, can you just speak to that momentarily? Is it? Yeah. So that bill itself yeah. is actually um, was designed to reform an existing economic growth incentive program, which okay. is a very narrow tax credit program that's been around for. 20-something years, maybe a little longer, that provides tax incentives to fairly large Vermont businesses who are looking to grow their jobs. Okay. Um, And it's sort of supposed to kick them over the edge into being able to grow jobs. Okay. Um, I think right now we know that 
The problem is not the number of jobs we have in Vermont, given how many folks are struggling to find people to work, but actually the quality of the jobs that we have. Right. Benefits, wages that actually pay for housing costs, all of that. That is sort of where the shortage is. And so, and when we spend state dollars giving them to the private sector, we want to make sure that's accountable. So yeah, that bill was designed to make all of that, um, modernize it basically, make it more accountable to government and make sure we're really incentivizing the kind of jobs that are going to make Vermonters' lives better. Okay. Um, that bill got sort of rolled into other bills, many of the pieces of it, and the part, um, most of that was the details that are going to be pretty boring. Okay. But the part that I think is really interesting is it kicked off a conversation that we're going to pick back up this year about what, how can we help the infrastructure that's needed for businesses to really thrive? Right. So how can we help municipalities and regions pay for the kind of infrastructure they need, like wastewater or the kind of electrical levels or the kind of telecom that they might need to really be thriving with our workforce? And then what do we need to do to make sure we're sort of shaping the economy that we want to be living in? Okay. All right. No, that, that's good. I, I, I saw it. It interested me, and I wanted to ask you about it. I know you guys are also working on a uh, paid family and medical leave. Can you speak to that now? Yeah. That one gave you a smile. Oh, I love that, Bill. All right. Um, so in the middle of the pandemic, things were dark and desolate, and we were many of us were stuck at home, and those of us who weren't stuck at home were working under really dangerous conditions. Yep. And I just felt so sure that we needed to learn something from all of it, that there was some really incredible beauty that was coming out of those moments, right? Like, I don't know if you saw the swans in Venice that sort yeah. of like took back over the city. The skyline in L.A. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> and so many of us, for really the first time, realized how important women's work was or how important caretaking work was. All of those children trapped at home, people not able to work. All of a sudden, employers were actually accommodating people's parenting needs right. or people's caregiving needs for older parents, mm -hmm. older loved ones. We sort of realized that for the first time in a while, admitted publicly in the papers that we're all really interconnected and we all have lots of caretaking responsibilities. <gasps> Shocker. I know. It's wild. Um, and we all like really cared about teachers and parents for a while. Anyway, so H66 came out of that. It's a paid family medical leave bill. It essentially says that all Vermonters deserve to have paid time off, not just those of us with salaried right. jobs. Right. And I think that's a real opportunity. You know, we see people who get pregnant and leave their jobs because they have no leave at all. Right. And then that employer needs to hire someone else at a big cost rather than just having someone cover for them, knowing that they'll come back. We know that a lot of folks, in my generation at least, are caring for their parents and their children simultaneously. Yep. And it makes it really hard to sort of cover your tracks and make up for what you need to make up for and work. And so this is really a way of saying that all businesses should be able to do this. One of the things, you know, I started my career in international development, mm -hmm. mostly working with multinational corporations and big governments. And then when I came back to Vermont and tried to apply all of that to Vermont's economy, the thing that I really noticed was our small businesses don't have the HR infrastructure yeah. to pull most of this stuff yep, off. That's very true. It's too much to ask of them. And so they're actually at a competitive disadvantage with big businesses that do have that HR infrastructure. And so I want to make sure that all of Vermont small businesses, whether that's the restaurant down the street or the small consulting firm on the second floor on Main Street, that they're all able to offer the same benefits to as the same big business. Yeah, no, it, it, th that's great. And, and it, does that look like that'll pass this session? So that bill passed the House resoundingly, more okay. than 100 votes um, in a really strong form, you know, 90% um, wage reimbursement, which means that people can afford to take leave. Okay. A lot of leave oh, yeah. packages mm -hmm. are like, yep. you can't actually afford to pay your bills when you're on leave. And it's expected to have some hearings in the Senate this. Okay, great. So new session starts in January. Mm -hmm. Pick one. What's the one thing you want to, to push through? I want to work on government accountability. Oh. I think Vermont's an amazing place to live, and I think we deserve to have a government that works and works for us. Okay. And so we there's been a, sort of a steady eroding in the capacity of government to serve over mm -hmm. the last few years. And yeah. so I really want to pick up the pieces, say we pass these great bills. Are they being implemented? Are they doing what we think they should be doing? Are they funded adequately to be serving folks? 
And I think we can do that all across state government. Great. Emily Kornheiser, thanks for jumping on Vermont to Two today. Appreciate having you uh, and your insight. Continue good work uh, up north. Thank you.